The regular session for the Madison County Board of Education for Thursday, August 19th, 2021 is called into session. Ms. Bates, would you please uh, open us up with uh, invocation, please? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the glory that you show to us every day in your nature and the things that you look forward for us. And I pray that we would all move forward tonight with positivity, grace, and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Before we uh, move forward with the uh, opening of the uh, meeting and the re rest of the agenda, I wanted just to read a statement, uh, just kind of laying some ground rules for this evening's meeting. Um, we, the Madison County Board of Education, strive to and historically have conducted meetings in a respectful and professional manner for the purpose of doing the work of the county school system. While we may not always agree with each other and decisions made, we respect each other's opinions and positions on topics dis discussed, agree to disagree, and in the end, supporting those decisions as a board. I think it is important to remember that our priorities are to provide a reasonably, not risk-free, environment for all students of Madison County Schools to learn in. We do our very best to ensure the safety and health of all Madison County students. At the same time, we have an obligation to provide a consistent, high-quality education for all of the children in Madison County Schools. This implies, too, that our teachers and your child and children and all of the children of Madison County Schools are in school learning, not at home. We have a finite number of substitutes to backfill for teachers that are out for a variety of reasons to include COVID. I think we would all agree that in-school learning is far better than remote learning. It is one of the reasons that we only offered the remote option through the Madison County Virtual Academy this year. Many of you are here this evening with regard to our COVID policies and the recent decision to move to a level one masking. There is no shortage of personal opinions regarding this. Please know, no additional decisions regarding our current status will be debated this evening, and no decisions regarding the mask requirement in schools will be made prior to the September 2nd meeting. For those who have requested to address the board, you will be given that opportunity to do so in due time. If you are here and did not request to address the board, you will not be offered the opportunity to speak tonight. This meeting is not an open meeting and requests to address the board are to be made in accordance with board policy 72 hours prior. If you would like to address the board at our next regularly scheduled meeting on the September 2nd, you can do so by signing up this evening the sign-up sheet is in the back of the room in the corner uh, by that door as you walked in. Please know, this meeting is also being broadcast live via YouTube and will be a part of the official record of minutes for this meeting. The expectation of the board is for this meeting to be conducted in the same professional, respectful manner as always. Because of this, and regardless of which side of the debate you are on, we ask that you respect those who are at the podium speaking. Outbursts and loud clapping will not allow will not be allowed so that our audience watching at home can hear what is being said. If participants or audience members do not conduct themselves in a respectful manner, I will recess the meeting and ask the deputies in the back of the room to assist in restoring order. We will continue with the meeting only when I am assured by the deputies that order has been restored. Again, I ask for your assistance in helping me to make this meeting a productive and informative meeting for all, and I thank you for your cooperation up front. At this time, I'll yield the floor to Dr. Minsky, who is filling in for uh, Mr. Perkins this evening. And as we're getting ready to get started with opening the meeting, I do want to um, state, as I did last meeting, that I have been in regular contact with Mr. Perkins, our superintendent, and the recommendations made tonight are his recommendations. Um, also, Mr. Perkins asked that for me to pass along to those that will be addressing the board this evening that he will be listening in remotely and he appreciates you taking the time to share your concerns. So with that being said, I recommend approval of the agenda dated August 19th, 2021. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second for the rec recommendation of the approval of the agenda dated August 19th, 2021. Any discussion? <clears throat> if there is none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Item B, under opening meeting, I recommend approval of the minutes dated June 3rd, June 17th, June 24th, and June 29th, 2021. Motion. Second. I have a recommendation for approval of the minutes dated June 3rd, 17th, 24th, and 29th, 2021. Any discussion? If there is no discussion, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 All right, administrative items. Item A, I recommend approval of the bids as submitted. Motion. 
second. I have a motion and a second for the recommendation and approval of the following bids as submitted. Any questions with regards to the bids? And I believe Karen is online if there aren't any questions for her. If there's no questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 Item B, I recommend approval of the contracts for services as submitted. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second for the recommendation and approval of contracts for services as submitted. Any discussion? Angie, you look like you had a, something to say. No. No, okay. <laughs> looked like you were ready to say something. No, I was making sure Brian was okay over here. Got it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Item C, I recommend approval of the personnel items and addendum as submitted. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second for the recommendation and approval of personnel items and addendum as submitted. Any discussion? I have a, uh, Ken, are you on? Is Ken on? He is. Hey, hey Ken. How many additional uh, openings left do we have to fill for teaching staff or any, any other, anything like that? Are we are we 100 percent? I said, how many additional positions have yet to be filled with regards to teachers or um, staff in the schools? Have we had 100 percent yet? We still have 70 open. 70. Okay. Wow. And that's a combination of teachers, staff, other, other. Um... Okay. Thank you, Ken. Any, addi any additional discussion, questions for Ken? If there are none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Item D, I recommend approval of the principal contract for the Madison County Virtual Academy as submitted. Motion. Second. I have a motion in two seconds. For the recommendation and approval of the following principal contract for Madison County Virtual Academy as submitted. Any, any questions, any comments on the contract? If there are none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Do you want to congratulate Ms. Jennifer McKinney, who is now our Madison County Virtual Academy principal? So moving on to item E, I recommend approval of the principal contract for Lynn Fanning Elementary School as submitted. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second for the recommendation and approval of the principal contract for Lynn Fanning Elementary School as submitted. Any discussions? If there are none, all those in favor say aye. 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 And want to congratulate Ms. Tasha Knight, who will be the new principal at Lynn Fanning Elementary School. Um, both of those individuals will be working with Dr. Hedden. They're currently sitting assistant principals at Hazel Green <coughs> High School, so they'll be working with Dr. Hedden and the two current principals on a transition plan, so we'll get them in place as soon as possible. So moving on to item F, I recommend approval of the supplemental contracts and discontinued contracts as submitted. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second for the recommendation and approval of supplemental contracts and discontinued contracts as submitted. Any questions? If there are none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Sir, I'll turn it over to you for the request to address the board. All right, thank you. All right. I have 11 individuals that have requested to address the board this evening. Uh, they are Mary Lee Sharp. Okay. Uh, Sarah Foster. Here. Okay. Daniel McGoriak. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Sean Powell. Norman Duffel, uh, Sherry Har, Sherry. Sherry, I'm sorry, Eric Boyd, Mr. Boyd, are you here? Okay. Uh, Francine Slate, okay. <laughs> Mark Coward, Co Coward, okay, Coward. Coward, okay, and Ellie Coward, okay, and Bronson McLean, okay. Uh, I'll put Mr. Boyd at the end in case he shows up, shows up late. Okay. 
Your comments, and I'm only going to read this once, but if I have to read it again, I, I can, but your comments will be limited to three minutes. In the event you wish to address the board on an issue involving the general reputation and character, physical condition, professional competence, mental health, or in some instances job performance of an individual, or confidential student information, the board will hear your comments in executive session. If you are unsure whether your comments should be made in executive session, please let me know and our board attorney, Ms. Cynthia Thompson, can assist. Does anybody have any comments that are going to be made that fall into that category? Okay. Okay. So when, you get, when you're called up, I'll have a timer here. Uh, when the timer's up, I'll ask you to step away from the podium so that we can let the next person come in and, and speak. There's 11 of you, so that's about 33 minutes of, of comments this evening. Okay? So we'll start with Mary Lee Sharp. And you're welcome to remove your mask so that you can speak clearly into the microphone so that all of the uh, people at home and on YouTube can hear what you're saying. Let me, uh, let me get my timer set up here. Thank you. Mm, I'm a short person over here. Uh, timer. Oh, it's already set up. Okay, you can begin. All right, my name is Marilee Sharp. Uh, board members, members and any faculty staff, I uh, appreciate you for letting me speak tonight. Um, it's funny to some extent that I'm here speaking right now that I actually wrote this speech several weeks ago in hoping preparation that this would not happen to my child. Um, it seems in just five full days that just, I just barely fell short. So to go on with that, um, you'll have to excuse me if I go back from present to past tense. Um, I am a born and raised Madison County resident, attended Madison County schools in kindergarten through my entire life, went to college in Madison County. Um, so I'm just another, another number here. But my son is not, and that is the issue. My son is a loving social butterfly who loves to run and play. He and his sister are my greatest achievements in life. He has an IEP in place and has had the opportunity to attend Madison County's program since he uh, was three years old. So I have been his advocate from the day he was created. I have been his advocate from the day he began his early intervention journey, and I will continue to do so for the rest of his life. He's supposed to attend pre-K five days a week this year, and um, it looks like that's probably not going to happen. He's been placed in the program primarily due to a severe speech delay, and we have other concerns as well. His teacher and his teacher, teacher aides have been wonderful. I'm truly grateful for them to be able to have the opportunity for him to learn from. If you haven't already done the math, he's been in the school system for almost two years. Okay, In those two years, while in school, he's had to cover his face with a mask and his teacher's face with a mask and his aides and his speech therapist with a mask. So my son, who hardly speaks, has had a physical barrier placed over his face every single day in attendance in the school system <sighs> since coronavirus has become an issue. I have to point out the obvious here. How is a person, a child, an adult for that matter, supposed to be able to learn to read lips, mimic motions of his teacher's lips when his and her faces are covered? How is he supposed to be encouraged to speak with something slapped over his face? What is the first thing you do when you want somebody to be quiet? You shove something over their face, point blank. So what does that, does that seem to send a mixed signal to you? Because it does to me, and I can't imagine to be a five and a half year old with a developmental delay, what kind of signal that might send him. And I personally cannot imagine in his situation what it must feel like to be violated like that and not be able to speak out on it, express his concerns, or understand why it's happening. So trying, I'd also like to speak on behalf of the staff. It's unfair to them to be able to communicate with their children and expect to communicate with the enraged parents sitting here today. Um, you know, some will argue with me and that's fine. Uh, I welcome that. Um, I think to each their own. It's a not one mask fits all situation. There are certain people that, you know, that you just can't put on masks for. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Sarah Foster. My 
My name is Sarah Foster. I'm a senior at Sparkman, an excellent student, 34 in our ACT, a leader at her church, has never had a behavioral issue in 13 years until this week when I got a call because she wanted to breathe free air and she's not done anything that would warrant an infringement of her constitutional rights and bodily autonomy. On the same day that she was chosen as one of 10 by her teachers out of 650 seniors to mentor new Sparkman students. Since then, that teacher has disparaged her to every teacher at Sparkman High School. I, I will conclude my argument with this story. My background, I'm a prior Navy nurse currently working as a clinical transition planner, which means I move military, civilian, and VA hospitals all over this country and the world. And I've seen what's really happening with my own eyeballs. I'll begin with the actual science of masks don't work. Dr. Jim Meehan, an ocular inflammation and immunology specialist who's studied the transmission of flu for 30 years, states, Random controlled trials have shown masks are not effective. Masks block arterial oxygen and overall oxygen intake, significantly creating higher levels of CO2 in the body, exacerbating breathing difficulties. The longer the duration of wearing the mask, the greater the drop in blood oxygen. Masks cause anxiety, sleeplessness, fungal infections, and bacterial infections, and bacterial pneumonia is on the rise. Untrained members of the public are wearing these dirty masks, not in a sterile environment, which is why lawmakers should not be involved in medical decision making. Cloth masks can increase the aerosolization of COVID, increasing the transmission of disease. We were told by Fauci, the CDC director, and NIH that masks play very little role in stopping viral illness. The science did not change, but the politics did. A single virus of SARS-CoV-2 is about 60 to 140 nanometers of 0.1 microns. The pore size in a surgical mask is 200 to 1,000 times that size. It's like throwing sand at a chain link fence. Have you even considered the health effects of forcing our kids to breathe through sweaty, spit, and snot-soaked dirty pieces of cloth, turn pe petri dishes all day? South Carolina, Florida, and Texas have all past state laws prohibiting school administrators from requiring students to wear a mask. The governor of Tennessee just wrote an executive order stating parents can opt out of a mask mandate if the school or health board enacts one. A senator and Duke trained physician for 33 years, also trained in immunology and virology, states we don't have to accept these mandates. We can make our own choices. No one should follow the CDC's anti-science mask mandates. There's no reason for mask mandates or school lockdowns. If a school system decides to lock down, he's going to put a bill forth that will defund them and allow parents a choice to put where to put money for their schools. We have to stand for and choose freedom. This is an encroachment of government on our freedom. COVID is almost no risk to kids. 4.2 million positive cases in 18 months. 0.008% have died. 480 kids died of the flu in 2018-2019 before the flu disappeared, which is more than COVID this entire time. I didn't see masks then. I'll conclude with this. My youngest was born in 2009 during the swine flu when my oldest was in kindergarten at Legacy, which was the first global flu, flu pandemic in 40 years with 60.8 million cases, twice that of COVID. When she came home, I had her shuck her clothes in the laundry room and then go take a shower before she could touch her brother. I didn't take him out much till Easter. That was my decision. I didn't ask y'all to put on a mask. I didn't take him back to church. They gave me a hard time for that. And so we strive daily to teach our kids not to pass blame to someone else. Thank you, Ms. Foster. <laughs> Mr. McGoriak. Good evening. My name is Daniel McGuirk and I stand here as a concerned father defending my right as a parent to make medical decisions such as the masking of my child. Parents are uniquely in the best position to know what's right for their children's health, not the school board. Have you even considered the health effects of forcing kids to breathe through sweat, spit, and soak dirty rags? How about the effects on their developing immune systems or the psychological harm of forced masking? The World Health Organization's own guidance states kids five and under should not be masked. They also caution of the potential impact on learning and social development of those six to 11. Governor Ivey herself said kids should return to class with no mask mandate. So we ordered a disposable mask for the boys. And um, the first warning I noticed, this product makes no claim of antimicrobial, antiviral protection, infection prevention, or reduction. Then the scarier warning, this product can cause cancer and reproductive harm. Seriously, what are we doing to our children? A group of parents sent their kids masks to a lab. Half came back contaminated with one or more strains of pneumonia-causing bacteria, one-third with one more strains of meningitis-causing bacteria, one-third contaminated with dangerous antibiotic-resistant bacteria, in addition, pathogens that can cause fever, ulcers, acne, yeast infections, and strep throat were identified. We've been told it's only a minor inconvenience. If it saves one life, right? 
Well, in a study published in the Annuals of Internal Medicine, researchers evaluated more than 6,000 individuals and found that masks did not significantly reduce the risk of infection. The group that reportedly wore their masks exactly as instructed, 2% tested positive as compared to 2.1 of the control group, is cautioned as well, improper wearing of a mask such as touching your face or fiddling with it contaminates it and can even increase the risk of exposure. Most adults I observe do not follow proper mask protocols. So how can you expect my child to do so? Putting him more at greater risk. How about other consequences? Polish researchers found within just three minutes the level of carbon dioxide breathed in mass children was six times higher than the limit set by the German Environmental Office. Explains why my five-year-old complains he can't breathe in one. And if he feels he can't breathe in one at school, how is he supposed to stay focused? What about psychological harm? Mass mutes nonverbal cues and can lead to anxiety and depression. Seeing people speak is a building block of phonetic development. If my child cannot see this teacher enunciate words or her voice is muffled by the mask, that's a roadblock to his success. The flu, except for last year, when it miraculously disappeared, kills more children than COVID. Yet there's never been any mention of masks for flu. So let's stop pretending. These masks only serve as a security blanket. Yet they're being forced on our children when the long-term side effects, physically, emotionally, and mentally Thank are Thank you, unknown. Mr. McGurk. Thank you. Mr. Powell. Thank you for letting me speak today. I'm here today to address the policy of students being forced to wear masks again and the topic of freedom of choice. I'm an Army veteran who has served two combat tours. I've been overseas. I've built governments. I've seen them fall. One thing we were trained on was NBC. We've been through gas chambers where we've had to go through and put masks on. We've had these chemicals inserted into our lungs to feel what the experience was like. This is not to that extent. These masks do not work. They are not N95, and they do not create a seal around the mouth. These children are going to school and they're wearing this mask over their face, they're not getting these verbal cues and reading cues from their teachers. They're more terrified of getting in trouble from their teachers when they want to take a gasp of breath, of air, than they are reading, than they are learning. They're not seeing smiles anymore. All they're seeing is down eyes. That's all they're seeing. Plato once said, the price good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. Right now, I'm not calling anyone evil, but I am saying there is some indecisiveness going on. We need action, and we need to be in favor of our children. I believe it's our freedom of choice that's the most important. These kids should have just the right to take off their masks as any adult. I'm having friends right now who are having to look for new jobs because they're being forced to wear masks and get vaccines that aren't even vaccines. They're killing animals. They bypass those clinical trials. They're going straight to humans. It's not FDA approved. It's emergency use only. So these mandates are coming through. I witnessed a scuffle earlier. It wasn't even a scuffle. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. A disagreement. I'll just label it like that. A disagreement on whether you could wear a mask into this building. The issue at point there was that this was a, a private access building where we're having a public forum. That's how these corporations are forcing Americans to concede, to capitulate. We are told to mask up or get fired. We are told to vaccine or get fired. Schools, American children are being talked to in school about how their parents are incompetent. Thankfully, that is not happening here. But just the other day, Leah Kenyon at Leahy High School in Utah, most of your parents are dumber than you are. We're seeing that in the media right now, and these, these kids are stepping up and they're recording things. The mortality rate in children for COVID-19 is less than 1%. They're virtually unaffected. I caught COVID. My family caught COVID. My kids caught COVID. We didn't know the kids had COVID. They were taking care of us. So I'd like to reference historical references. Sanford Prison Experiment on a global scale. That's what I think this is. How people will readily conform to the social roles they are expected to play. Fun. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell.
Mr. Duffel. Good evening, board. Thank you for the time. I have an 11-year-old daughter in Madison County. Um, she has an individualized education plan, the IEP, and for her, she has speech issues. It's very difficult for her to be understood, and it's much more difficult for her to be understood when she you cannot read her lips and her voice is muzzled by a mask. My daughter has told me many times that she, when she's wearing a mask at school, she does not speak with classmates and she does not ask questions. In essence, the mask has silenced my daughter at school. Um, it's, in, it's time to end mandatory masking for our schools for these th reasons. It's anti-science, it ignores common sense, and most importantly, it harms our children. Um, first, mandatory masking for our kids is anti-science because the need for universal masking is not supported by any data or scientific studies. And I won't go into all the data many people have already talked about already. Um, Second, mandatory masking for kids ignores common sense because mask use in practice by our children and staff is not effective and mostly just for show. Children and staff are often wearing ineffective cloth masks and they dangle below their noses and mouths. I've seen it in my own eyes many times. And I have a quote right here that you might find very interesting that comes from um, a Q&A from a Dr. Kimberlin here in Birmingham, Alabama. He was on, they posted this on Alabama Department Health's own Twitter page. And this is what Dr. Kimlin said. With how transmittable this virus is, even in classes where there is a mass mandate, we will probably see some cases. That's coming straight from the Alabama Department of Health. That's it. That's the ball game. He is saying that mask mandates are not effective on the Twitter page for Alabama Department of Health. Here's my final point. Mandatory masking harms children. Simply put, forcing children to wear a mask for eight hours a day inhibits learning and instills unfounded fear and anxiety. I'm calling on the board to have courage and to take a stand for our children to stop these irrational mask mandates. I realize you're under great pressure from the state and federal health agencies to toe the line, but our children are looking to us to be calm and level-headed. I urge you to follow the simple, sensible example of other school districts in neighboring states that have abandoned mask mandates. Please do not wait till September 3rd. Drop them now. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Duffel. <laughs> Ms. Har. I'm ready. Oh. There we go. <laughs> go ahead. Yesterday, thank you. Yesterday on the Dale Jackson show, he mentioned that masks have limited protection. Masks have been utilized as single use items for patients in isolation in the hospital. Masks were not meant to be worn continuously. Prolonged use is more of a detriment to the wearer due to increased occurrence of touching the mask, such as David touched his uh, eight times, or sorry, 10 times since we've been here. Uh, Let's see. Prolonged use, like I said, is a detriment because it increases the occurrence of touching mask, collection of pathogens in the mask, and dangerously high levels of carbon dioxide. As mentioned before, in Gainesville, Florida, a concerned parent sent her mask to the Florida University of Florida for lab analysis. Eleven bacterial parasites and fungal pathogens were noted some of which are antibiotic resistant. These pathogens are known to cause pneumonia, fever, ulcers, severe acne, yeast infections, thre uh, strep throat, periodontal disease, and meningitis. In regards to the concern of dangerously high levels of uh, carbon dioxide, a study of 25,000 children ages 6 to 17 found uh, carbon dioxide levels at 13,000 parts per million. The safe range is 2,000 parts per million. The average is 400. It's dangerously high. It's not safe for our kids. 
And that's after three minutes of testing, not all day long. There's profound psychological damage being done to our children. According to the American Institute for Economic Research, death by suicide in ages 0 to 24 rose 23% in 2020. Robert Redfield, the director of the CDC, stated, we're seeing more deaths from suicide and drug overdose than COVID in our youth. I say there's got to be a better way to help our children. David stated on the radio yesterday that we just need to do something. This something doesn't need to include interventions that harm our children. We need to focus on healthy alternatives such as recommending vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc to support their immune system. Some school board members throughout the country have argued that mass mandates are needed to avoid litigation if the child becomes ill with COVID. How could someone possibly pr prove that a child caught COVID at Thank school? Thank you, Ms. Hire. Is Mr. Boyd here? Mr. Boyd, go ahead, sir. Well, there's not really a whole lot more I can say other than what the parents have been saying already. Um, you know, if you put people in fear, you can get them to do just about anything. And that's exactly what Hitler did. So it's almost like we're reliving what happened in World War II and the way Hitler treated uh, a lot of people. Um, I just want to say one thing. This is very important because we've got to remember who's in control and it's not us. My God and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is bigger than all of this. All right. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Um, the CDC is changing their guidelines on the testing because they want to be able to distinguish between COVID and influenza. So give that some thought. The, the, the CRT testing that they're using, they're running the cycles up too high, making them inaccurate, causing high false positives. And that's why they're changing the testing procedure. So take that into consideration as well. I'd like to believe that I'm not the only parent asking questions. And from what I've already heard, I know that's true. And we're being made to feel like it's wrong for us to ask questions. I mean, we just, we want to understand. We're using common sense. You know, we're the caretakers of our children. We want them to be healthy. We want them to learn. We want them to be able to think freely and interact with one another, run and play do things together. They're not doing that. You're hindering that with these masks. Um, my son, he, he made the comment the other day. He said, everybody's so far apart. That's a problem. I have a problem with that. He recognizes it. You know, are there studies for mask wearing? I mean, I have not seen any. That they actually help? I, I personally believe, based on what I've learned about masks, that they do more harm than good. Um, we've seen no lab studies, no spreadsheets. Parents are just trying to understand. And we're doing our own homework. We're doing the research. I encourage you, if you haven't done your research, do the research. The truth is out there. The answers are out there to be found. Look around you. Think about everything that's happening around you and look at these kids, they're miserable. Stop making these children miserable. You know, the thing is, if we can't get our kids unmasked, thank you, Mr. Then Boyd. Thank you. The money follows the children. Just remember that. <laughs> Miss Slate? Good evening. I'm here tonight to discuss facts that should have been factored in when deciding to mandate masks in our county. I believe Madison City Schools have helped some of these facts since they reported a record high in COVID cases and they have all been masked since day one. We know the FDA granted an EUA on cloth masks under the category of a medical device. Now with that EUA comes requirements and regulations. Before mandating masks, did any of you sit down to read the requirements for cloth masks to be considered under that umbrella? 
They have them listed on the FDA website, and I just want to highlight a few important facts that contradict mask wearing. The mask must not be labeled in a manner that would misrepresent the mask's intended use. The labeling should not state or imply that the product is for antimicrobial, antiviral, <coughs> infection prevention, or reduction. In addition, the EUA includes numerous advertising and promotion requirements, including but not limited to no implied or expressed claims that the mask is safe and effective for the prevention or treatment of patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. All printed matter must clearly state the product has not been FDA cleared or approved. Now please ask yourselves, why are you mandating that our children wear masks when they say these things directly on the packaging? In case you didn't read the packaging that your mask came in, I brought in samples here for you from our local Walmart, Publix, and CVS. All packages confirm these statements. Governor Kay Ivey has stated repeatedly since April that we need to move forward, that no mask mandate should be enforced, and that children do not need to be in class wearing masks. Why is the governor of Alabama saying this, and you as the student board have decided not to listen? One thing every parent in Madison County can agree on is that we, are, as the parents, are passionate about our children and their safety. As student board members, you were not voted in to make personal, private health decisions for my child or any other child in Madison County. If you continue to take away the right for parents to decide if their child should attend with or without a medical device across their face, then here are my suggestions to you. I suggest you monitor how they are worn. If they become dirty or retain enough moisture that makes them wet, which holds bacteria, then the mask needs to be thrown out and that child needs to be given a brand new one. You need to ensure they aren't touching the front of their masks with their hands and also ensuring proper ventilation while they wear them. All of these are listed on the CDC website for children who are required to wear masks for several hours at a time. By continuing this mask mandate, you are going to be held accountable. You are setting yourselves up to be liable for anything that happens to these students and their health while being mandated to wear a medical device that you are not monitoring, that have not been cleared by the FDA, and that have proven in numbers over the past year, they do not work. Thank you, Ms. Slate. Mr. Cowherd. Good evening, uh, Madison County School Board. I'm not here today because I want to be, but I will stand up for my kids and I'll stand up for their kids as well. <clears throat> the mask that you, uh, you, the board, Mr. Perkins, and your medical professionals are mandating our kids to wear are unconstitutional and a danger to their medical health, medical and mental health. Even though there may only be a few speakers here today to address your overreach of power, there are thousands of us that feel the exact same way. It's hard for people to stand up here and tell you what they believe and how and why they believe it. Because, of they, because they fear it, they fear for their kids' safety, they fear how they'll be treated against something that's so controversial. <clears throat> you say you wanna follow the science, but you're not following all the science. You pick and choose which uh, science that you believe in, and you tell the parents, we must follow it without any questions. I don't believe uh, you're the ones to make the medical de decisions for my family or any other one of these families, um, you ne and you never will. While uh, I may not have a medical deg uh, degree. I'm more than qualified to read the medical research and determine the risk for my family. If you followed all the science, you would have come across a study that addressed the significant risk of wearing these masks. As they mentioned before, O2 levels, oxygen levels, and all this. And to sum up it up a little bit, up until now, in this study, there has been no comprehensive investigation to the adverse health effects masks can cause. This study was published April 2021. Since, let's see, what if you're wrong about these masks? What are the side effects? What are the long-term risks? Whether it's dementia, whether it's they start dying at a young age, all these are adding up and we don't know. These are risks that you're just saying we're willing to take. Um, then we overlook suicide. Suicide, as mentioned, is up over 100% in some states, but 30% all the way around. <clears throat> if you want to look at anywhere, look at Sweden. Sweden had no mass mandates. They had limited restrictions. And there's 1.3 out of the 1.4 million people that caught COVID, 1.3% died. All I ask for you is let the parents choose what's best for their child. I want, uh, if you want to wear a mask, fine. If you don't want to wear a mask, fine. If you want to go virtual, fine. If the mask work, it doesn't matter what I choose for my child or what they choose for their child. Lastly, 
I stand here today to tell you that it is my mission to have each and every one of you removed off of this board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coward, Mrs. Mrs. Coward. Hi, I have a second grader. He and our family have been blessed to have the absolute best teachers that he could ever have for kindergarten first and now second. That being said, he has yet to have a full and normal school year. Last Friday, I spoke with the lead nurse from Madison County Schools. As of 8-12, Madison County had 207 positive COVID cases, 182 students, 25 staff members, an infection rate of 1.05%. As of 4 p.m. yesterday, per the dashboard, the infection rate is 2.5%. This is after two weeks of school and after one week of mandatory masking. The school board agreed on 8-2, the 25-minute bark on the YouTube video, that we would start at a level zero and that, quote, if we haven't started school, there couldn't be anybody to outbreak, also minute 25. So if we assume that the school year started with zero positives, these numbers show that masks aren't doing anything. We all know that there is sufficient research that show that masks don't work at slowing the spread, but it continues to be ignored. 503 students out of near 20,000 is not an outbreak. Why are we forcing the well to live as if they are sick or to assume that they are sick or to assume that they might get sick? It's not normal to run to the doctor for a runny nose, a headache, or because we might have a virus that we might be asymptomatic of. Parents knows best. I know what's best for my child, nobody else. It's not my responsibility or any other parent's responsibility to keep others from possibly maybe getting sick by wearing a mask. If concerned, they can sign their child up for virtual learning. I've been told by staff and MCSS staff that there is no threshold within our schools to gauge a mask mandate. Excuse me. There's no excuse for that. And we all know what it means, mask mandates. We get no say so. You, our school board, currently have too much overreach. And you aren't doing what you said you would do. What happened to quote, the goal is to look at this as as small as an entity as possible versus having the wholesale across the school system, minute 14, 50 seconds. That would have been nice because Mount Carmel currently has nine positives and three are already back from quarantine. Nine out of 603 students at that school is not an outbreak and does not warrant mass mandates for our school or the rest of the county. Just like last year, we as parents have been backed into a corner and we've been left no other option but to leave Madison County Schools. So as of 817, my husband and I unenrolled our second grader from Mount Carmel because MCSS refuses to let us, his parents, make that decision for ourselves. We're beyond frustrated and we're really not convinced that anybody's even listening, but our children are worth it, so we are here. I implore you to reevaluate the situation and allow us parents to choose to mask or not. Thank you, Mrs. Coward. Uh, and finally, uh, Mr. McLean. Thank you for hearing me. I want to thank all the other parents who have spoken tonight. You've pretty much taken all my words, and I'm not even mad about it. <laughs> you know, I think someone else mentioned earlier, no one, absolutely no one, who is calling for the unmasking of the kids is calling or is saying that someone can't wear a mask. Everyone has that right. Everybody has their own situation. Every parent knows their kid better than you guys do. I was extremely proud. Half of my upbringing in school was in Jackson County. And I was extremely proud of the superintendent, Mr. Dukes in Jackson County, who said, we will not do a mask mandate. We will not even discuss it anymore because they knew it was not their place.
So last Thursday, it was announced that there was going to be the mask mandates. Friday morning, my seventh grader and first grader were unenrolled. They did not go to school. And as of today, they are now private school kids because the private school still gives me the option to be their parent. It should be, let's look at it this way. We're talking about a mask. It's pretty minuscule, school, you, you would think. But if my child has to go and have a major surgery, they can't even touch them until I sign off on it, until the parent says they can. Let's say my daughter, God forbid, is in some kind of accident and she's on life-saving equipment. They can't unplug her until I say they can unplug her. But you say I can't even choose them, choose to take, send them to school without a mask. Look at, do you see the difference? I know that you can. I, I feel like I don't need to say too much else because everybody else here has done it. I know I've had to deal with friends, family members, my own mother telling me I'm just being silly and being stubborn. But what I'm doing is I'm teaching those two kids right there that when you have your convictions and that you have your beliefs, you don't back down for it for anybody. Amen. When I unenrolled them, I signed their paperwork. I pleaded with their counselors and the registrars. I said, please give me another option so that I don't have to do this because I didn't want to have to do it. And they said, there is no other option. You either wear the mask and that's it. And that's not an option. Thank you, Mr. McLean. And thank you all for coming this evening. I appreciate your comments. All right, Mark, continue on. All right, Austin, if you can pull up the demographic study form, please. Thank you, sir. So we had the demographer who has visited our school. He was here the month of mostly of June and some of July, kind of finishing up, giving us a study and an overview of the building construction and a guide to kind of address any um, increases in the number of students that we have. I, I can take, I'll go ahead and take a break if y'all want to, if anybody else wanted to step out. All right, well, so basically with this presentation, this is um, taken from Dr. Salmon, who is the individual who did our demography study. And I'm just going to kind of go through the slides with you. You do have these in the board folder um, to be able to review. And I will be going over these with our school principals um, in the upcoming weeks so they can kind of see where we are and what's going on as far as any growth in certain in particular areas of our system. So one of the things that they look at is the U.S. Census population. So for Madison County, for our district, um, see 2012, we were 118,000 up to 126,000. And the next slide will actually give the updated 2020 information. So countywide, um, and that was an estimate because this, he completed his study right uh, um, about a week before the 2020 census came out. So it doesn't necessarily reflect all that, but he had an estimate of, um, 30, 379,000 um, residents in Madison County. Um, as far as we're looking at subdivision, so division data, you can see um, the districts and those are the commission districts on the top. And if you go down to the bottom, you can see the number since 2015. And I actually have a chart that I will show you guys. It was very difficult to see um, at a board meeting, but he did an overlay of where the new subdivisions are. And it's, it's very evident that our District 1 Hazel Green is getting a significant number of 
new houses and new subdivisions in. And we'll, we have a little bit more on that. So you can see the map, and these are the commission um, districts again, or school, yeah, this is a commission district, excuse me. And the numbers there represent the number of subdivisions since 2015 that, or excuse me, not subdivision, housing units that have been added to those areas um, since 2015. So when we look at our census residential building permits, and this is without including Madison City, Huntsville City, and Triana. So for 2020, we had 1,522 building permits. So far, and I believe he was ending this sometime in mid-June, we had 703 building permits. Um, so you can see there, again, we continue to grow. It, it, Huntsville is a great place to live, and it's very evident by the people wanting to move here. So district enrollment history. So looking back the past five years, so since 1617, you can kind of see our enrollment. You do look at the 2021, again, that is a year in which we had COVID. We did have parents who chose to pull their children out, put their children in homeschool, private schools last year for many reasons um, due to COVID. And that's kind of his take is why we see a little bit of a decrease um, in the current enrollment. Now, our enrollment for, tw for this school year, the 21-22 school, school year, will come um, the 20th day after Labor Day is when we get our official number. So once we get that in, we'll make sure we get that to the board. So when he's looking at um, census population enrollment, it kind of gives you um, information, you know, showing that 2012, 16.2% of the Madison County population attended Madison County schools. 2019, we're at 14.85, so relatively consistent um, since 2012. So he also gets into live births, is another thing that he looks at, is the live births, and he has a percentage based on live births and how many attend um, in first grade. And again, we've been very consistent since 2016, 2017, at about 32, 33%. Um, one of the neat things that we did when we looked at the, um, when he shared his presentation with several of us the other day, on the first day of school, he sent me a text and said, this is what your enrollment's going to be. And on the first day of school, he was off by two students. So as far as district enrollment, looking at the past five years, this is K-6 across our system. And again, you can see the numbers, 2000 or 2021 20, was a little bit lower. Um, where the other years we were kind of staying pretty steady, a little bit of an increase. Seven, eight continues to grow, and that's our middle school grades. The nine, 12 growth, again, up slightly in 2021. So the other piece that he puts together is a chart. So this is enrollment in 2015. So when they were fifth, first graders, we had 1,375 students in that cohort. Moving along to 1920, we had 1,461 students in that cohort that are now fifth graders. And for this year, we were at 1,463. So a gain of two for that particular cohort. So again, we have growth in certain areas, but overall, um, it's kind of a steady growth. And we'll show that with capacity numbers when we get towards the end. So basically just a chart of our enrollment history. So looking at it through the year, there's the far left number from 18,911 um, from the 1516, that's our K-12. And you can see um, on the right-hand column, second to the last, we have pre-K through 12 numbers moving forward. So we are, I think it's right around 19,600, I believe is around that number that we are today. Um, but again, we'll get that official number 20 days after Labor Day. So enrollment history, looking at our different feeder patterns. So this is the Buckhorn High School area for our K-6 schools. Um, and again, we see a little bit of a decline from last year. Again, it's kind of with COVID. We just, it's one of those years we call it, the, you know, a COVID year I mean, the things we've had to deal with. And enrollment was one of those things. So our 7-8, again, down a little. Um, but again, when we look at the numbers moving forward in capacities, it's something we'll have to take a look at and address with some of our schools. Buckhorn High School, the 912, 
Um, 1,298, I believe it was like 1,320 students the other day when I looked at the Buckhorn enrollment. And again, not official till um, several more weeks. So overall, the Buckhorn area for K-12, um, been pretty steady. Um, maybe a little bit of a decline, but overall, again, big scheme of things, it's been pretty steady moving forward. So Hazel Green, um, again, a little bit of a dip for our K-6 schools. And those schools, again, include Walnut Grove, Hayes Green Elementary, and Lynn Fanning, um, as well as Moore's Mill. And that'll be something, we'll, those couple of the schools we'll be talking about here towards the end with the growth of students that we have. So then Hayes Green High School, seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade, again, you can see they continue to grow, and their numbers, I think, are even higher this year um, than the 666 that they had last year. The Hazel Green High School, the 912, again, last year they were 1245, and I believe they're over 1300 or right around 1300 right now. If I remember correctly, when I talked to Dr. Head, and he said they had an increase of around 80 to 100 students this year um, at their high school. So the enrollment for the Hazel Green area, um, again, relatively steady year to year, but again, we're seeing some um, growth in that particular area. So moving on to Madison County High School, um, K-8 schools in the past five years, um, slight decrease, um, but again, slight decrease when we're looking at some of these numbers. Madison County um, High School, again, past five years, you know, in 1718, 18, it was up to 537. They were down to 466 last year, and I'll have to get you the number. I'm not sure off the top of my head what their number was as far as their high school this year. So enrollment history, again, moving on to New Hope. So again, New Hope, as we can see, they continue to grow and continue to get more people in New Hope area. The seventh and eighth grade, again, an increase of 20 from last year. And again, I think they're a little bit higher this year as well. The New Hope High School area for the past five years, again, you can see the trend data. And then the whole K-12 group. So again, continues to increase. So Sparkman area, um, the K-5 schools, and again, those schools for the K-5 are um, Harvest, Madison Crossroads, Endeavor, Legacy, and Monrovia Elementary School. The 6-8 schools, again, Sparkman Middle and Monrovia Middle School, <clears throat> and again, they're down a little bit from previous year, and Sparkman High School, and that is both the Spartman High School and S9, um, 2391 last year, and their enrollment history. So some of the maps that he has, and again, I have the continuation maps. He, instead of doing some of them electronically, he did those on a, an overlay so that we can actually pull the overlays and see the years. And it, it's pretty interesting, and I'll be more than happy to get that out and show that to you here at, um, sometime when you all have an opportunity. Those are in Mr. Perkins' office right now. So you can see the digital overlay in 2015 of where the building is. And again, it's pretty spread out around um, our, our system. Moving on to 16, again, additional residential building permits is what he is pulling. 17, 18, and then when you do the overlay, it's, it's pretty significant when you look at that hazel green, the harvest, Madison Crossroads area. Um, the Cliff Farm area, which we'll be looking over at the Endeavor area, and then also up at the Buckhorn, and then also down at the Owens Crossroads and New Hope area. So projections. So he also does a projection. Now, he will tell you when he does his projections. He'll give you a 10-year projection, um, but he feels much more confident with his five-year projections. So we'll kind of go through these. It kind of goes through school by school. So again, the first yellow one, the 21-22 school year, that's his projection. We don't have those final numbers. You can see what they were the previous year. And then if you look at that 25-26, that's kind of the five-year projection. So you can see Mount Carmel with an increase. New Market School, again, with an increase. Riverton Elementary, and Riverton Elementary is one we're going to come back to because that will be one that we're going to have to take a look at here in the near future as far as capacity numbers. Riverton Intermediate School, 
um, as well. Buckhorn Middle School, when they stay relatively stable over the next several years, and then we see an increase after that five-year period. And then Buckhorn High School, again, staying relatively stable um, around the 1300 mark. So looking at Hazel Green, so this is another area in which we're seeing, um, I want to say, I think it's about 80% of the building right now is up in that District 1 area um, with building permits. So quite a significant amount of building houses and neighborhoods in that area. So looking at the K-4 um, historical at, at the elementary school, um, we actually, we have a team of us that I think there's four or five of us going out to visit several of these schools. Hazel Green Elementary School is one of them. We have, um, we believe we have several classrooms in those schools that could be utilized for four classrooms that are utilized for other things. It's, it's one of those things when you get to a school, if there's an empty classroom, it is filled with something, whether it's a teacher, a, an eight, somebody or something ends up filling in a drama room. It is used, utilized for something. So we're going to look at actually specific at how many rooms do we have available at some of these schools. Hayes Green Elementary is one of those schools we'll be looking at. Um, Lynn Fanning, and you'll see the capacity numbers. Um, they have, we've added that new lunchroom. We have converted the old lunchroom into um, some classrooms, some offices, a special needs classroom. So I think we were able to get four classrooms out of that one, I believe, um, which is helping with the capacity numbers. But again, Lynn Fanning is one of those schools that's kind of busting at the seams. There's not too much extra room in that particular school. Walnut Grove has a little bit of room to grow still, and you can see their projected numbers moving up again by about 20 students in five years. Moores Mill Intermediate is another school that is um, busting at the seams, and we'll see when we look at the capacity numbers here momentarily that they're a school that we're going to have to also take a look at and see if we need to make adjustments um, where the great configurations and, and some other things to take a look at um, for suggestions on helping with capacity as we move forward with the next couple of years. So Meridianville Middle School. Um, Meridian School Middle School was actually built for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. Right now it houses 7th and 8th grade students. So this is another one of our schools that we want to walk through next week and kind of get a tally of how many classrooms it could be utilized um, for instructional classrooms um, as we're looking at ideas and suggestions um, moving forward with capacities. And then Hazel Green High School, you can see their projection. So 1447, I'm not sure when they reconfigure in the next couple of years if they will be a school that moves up to 7A or not, um, but I think they'll be inching a little bit closer than what they have been in the past. Um, looking at Central, again, Central, we completed the cafeteria last year and we have reconfigured this summer their um, previous cafeteria into some classrooms, office spaces, um, nurses area. So that's another school. And again, it's a school that is increasing its enrollment um, over the next five years. Madison County Elementary School um, is another one that will be doing some increasing, but uh, right now we feel we have space there. And then Madison County High School kind of staying pretty much level. It's kind of a little bit up and down, but realistically, when you look at the numbers, it's, it's pretty level over the next five plus years. So looking at New Hope Elementary School, again, we had a little bit of a, a shift in those numbers, and si that significant shift was a grade configuration change at Owens Crossroads, where we have K-4, Owens Crossroads are now a K-4. The fifth and sixth grade students from Owens Crossroads went over to New Hope Elementary earlier than what they typically would in years past. So, um, and then the seventh and eighth grade from New Hope Elementary School moved to the high school. So we have a little grade configuration change. So that's why we're seeing a little bit of a jump in some of these numbers. Owens Crossroads um, numbers, and I need to double check on this one and I should have done this before the meeting and I'm not sure if he necessarily pulled out the, no, he has K-4, it is K-4. So he has the K-4 numbers. So he did the K-4 projections from before. My apologies. And then New Hope, again, their jump was when we moved seventh and eighth grade over. So again, they're a 7-12 school. 
Moving over to the Sparkman family, so Endeavor, and Endeavor's another one of those schools that I believe had close to 1,000 students in it at one time, so that's another school that we were going to walk through and kind of see what classroom space we have available um, in case we need to make some adjustments. Harvest, um, again, they continue to grow, and that's a school that is absolutely at capacity right now, and we're going to need to start conversations on next steps to help support them and kind of alleviate some of that. Um, I believe they're really close to 100% right now if they're not actually over 100% capacity. Legacy Elementary School, um, they have taken some declines, but you can see a, a little bit of an increase there. That will be another school that we'll be walking through, kind of looking at classrooms and see what spaces are available. Madison Crossroads is, you know, very similar to Harvest with the numbers and the projections. They are very getting very close to their capacity so again that's another one of those schools we want to take a look at and see if there's some options um, for us to to look at to help relieve some of those monrovia elementary school um, they do have some growth coming in which is great because we had a couple years of decline there so that is looking good I'm not sure we're, we are, I believe, going to walk through the elementary school as well. I don't think there's a lot of extra classrooms. Again, the, some of that has to do with the fact that we had to remove that pod area um, from the capacity numbers. And then also Monrovia Middle School. Again, slight gains over the next couple of years. Spartman Middle School. Again, their, their feeder schools are Harvest and Madison Crossroads, and we, just, we have a significant growth and significant housing gains out there, and again, they're, they are continuing to grow. Looking at Sparkman 9, again, we, we still have several classrooms and capacity um, space at Sparkman 9, um, which is a positive as we're moving forward, and then Sparkman High School as well. So um, looking at you know, a continuous increase in those number of students there. So the historical data as far as numbers, um, K-6 and the projections, so looking, you know, to gain a couple thousand students over the next couple of years um, in K-6, um, not as significant in the 7-8th system-wide. The projection, you know, a little under a thousand in the the 912 zones as well and then historically he, he is looking at 24 25 of us exceeding 20,000 students again projection based on housing based on live birth rates and census data so capacity analysis so when we're looking at this and let me see if i can get do i get a little yeah there we go uh, sorry i'm over at this one i'm gonna use the laser so the first column, again, name of the school, the student capacity number, and then if you move over to the first column here, it says building utilization factor, that's currently. So currently, Buckhorn High School, for example, is at 93.25% capacity. Um, moving on down to Sparkman High School at 90% capacity. Um, but again, Sparkman 9 on the same campus is 64% capacity. So his five-year projection, so that was a five-year projection he put together for us, um, giving in his projected numbers at each school, we see these building utilization, you know, Buckhorn being at 100% capacity, um, Sparkman High School being at 100% capacity. So again, the Green High School being at 95% capacity. And then again, he's not as confident with his 10-year projections, but again, if we're looking at 10-year projections, we've got three of our high schools that are be, will be over their capacity numbers. So again, this information is great because it kind of justifies what we think we're seeing, and then we can now begin that planning process of what we need to do moving forward to kind of meet these needs um, for our schools. Just a, a note on the Sparkman numbers, though. I mean, particularly in the 10-year, you, you're looking at 106%, and, then, and the ninth grade school is at 77%. I mean, you can balance that out. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So that's not absolutely that's not, should yes. not be taken as the school's going to be overcrowded. Yeah, and, and I we don't can balance that out. I don't know off the top of my head. I know there are, again, if there's a space in a in a school, it is occupied by someone, typically. So, I'm not sure as far as actual. If we're down to the nitty gritty, hey, we have to have classroom space. I'm not sure exactly how many classroom spaces are available there. Right. But again, that's something that we are looking at. I know Mr. Gazort and Mr. Malone are kind of assisting with that. 
So moving on to our middle schools. Again, for schools are on the left-hand side. The first capacity is our current capacity. So again, Riverton Intermediate School is kind of getting a little bit closer. And as we move at our five year, this is kind of the scary piece. So we're looking at Moores Mill Intermediate School being at 120% capacity and Riverton Intermediate School being at 108% capacity. So again, we're gonna start working on a plan to bring to the board to have some suggestions on how we might be able to alleviate some of that um, capacity numbers and get them down and get them manageable for class, classroom space. And then if we wanna get really worried about the whole thing, you look at the 10-year projection with 127% capacity at River Intermediate and 133% capacity at Moores Mill. So again, it's, and Spartman Middle School also being right up there. But again, it, it validates what we're seeing with the growth patterns and what we're hearing and allowing us to, okay, now we have the data, we have the information that we can start making a plan that we can present to you um, moving forward. It looks like there's capacity at Buckhorn Middle. That's what I was going to say. I mean, the ninth grade. yeah, yeah. The eighth grade out of them, or yeah. Yeah, so, so we can make some adjustments, absolutely. And here's our elementary capacity numbers. So... Uh, Again, this first column right here is the current capacity. So you can see Harvest is already at 110% capacity. The reason it's over capacity is they have portables on their campus. And I believe every portable is, I think, is now full with a classroom because we converted one of their storage portables into a classroom the other day um, to in improve the class size of those schools. Um, another one to look at is Madison Crossroads. So again, our hot spots for us right now we're looking at is Harvest, Madison Crossroads, Riverton Elementary is at 77% capacity, but again, looking forward, we're looking at 95% capacity. New Hope's starting to get up there. Lynn Fanning is, thank you, at 90%, there'll be 104. Um, Harvest at 122. So again, it, it's kind of giving us, okay, these are kind of the hot spots. This is what we need to look at moving forward to have a plan to present to y'all to um, address these issues. So that is my last slide. So I'm not sure if I can answer many questions, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to get them to our demographer. If there's something that didn't make sense or you need additional clarification, um, I'll be happy to get that to him and he can answer any questions as far as how the numbers were achieved and those type of things. And he did include the Cliff Farms, right? He did. Yes, sir. Just the, the numbers yes, sir. of lots seem to be odd. That's why I was wondering. Yes, sir. Um, the we thing hear, with, we hear the, a lot of great yeah, number of houses in the It is, area. and I think with that particular subdivision, it seems to be the prices in which the apartments and the houses are, houses are going to be starting prices would not necessarily be typically houses that you're going to have elementary age students. It's going to be more of your high school students. Um, but, yes, he has that into the... Um, information That's interesting okay. and again I, I would love for you guys to when you have an opportunity to stop by mr. Perkins office and we can show you the the overlay and you can you can really physically see all of the different um, housing units that they're proposing so so when are we going to begin the conversations about next steps with all this data when is that we started uh, last uh, we actually started this week and then our, our next step is to go out and physically walk some of these schools and look at those classrooms so that we can come back and say, okay, you know, the two drama rooms they have at this school and is, can be utilized for a classroom if we need it. And this is, this is kind of classroom space. That, that's kind of our first step is we want to make sure that we have the exact number of classrooms that are available so that we can kind of look and then present um, recommendations to y'all moving forward. Okay. All right. Next. Um, Austin, will you bring up the um, document level zero to level one, please? That's it. So one of the things just, you know, you, you, I was asked about an update for COVID. Again, I hadn't looked at the tracker before I left. I think it was something over 500 um, positive cases right now. And again, the COVID tracker, just to make sure I'm, I'm, we're clear, when that's put out, we take a snapshot of what the actual number of cases currently are in our school system. Um, 
and that is what's posted on the COVID tracker on our website. It is not a cumulative starting from the beginning of school. That's how many we've accumulated. That is actually the active number of cases. So if a student has COVID and they've already returned back to school, they are removed from the tracker. So it is just the active number of cases that we have. So that's kind of where we are. So as far as working through um, for our schools, again, we're, we're trying to get back to, I, I would say it's looking a little bit more like the end of last school year. Um, as far as level one so making sure that those classrooms are sanitized daily making sure our buses are getting sanitized once twice a daily um, airing out the buses one of the big changes i would say with the level one has been the cafeteria and schools are making sure that we have social distancing between students in the cafeteria and they also have schedules created so that the entire class. So it may be the fact that first grade eats in the cafeteria today and second grade is in their classrooms today. So, and then the next day they're, they're switching. So principals have put together schedules, have done a great job with getting those things out. But basically what we did is we provided our principals, we took this information from the Ready, Set, Forward plan and we provided that to our principals as, hey, here's some things we need to make sure that we are covering as we move from level zero to level one. Questions about the level one protocol? <coughs> Anything? All right. Yep. Alrighty. Any questions in general on anything this evening? I got, I got a question about, um, I had several parents call me and they wanted to know, I guess just for clarification on like when a child is sent home that the problem with their seeing is some of the kids are being sent home because they have uh, symptoms like runny nose yes, sir. and a cough. The problem they're running into is when they call their doctor, they can't, they can't come back to school until they can provide a negative test. The doctor will not give them a test until 72 hours of symptoms. So they're already out of the pretty much missing three to four to missing a week of school to come back is that, is that i guess what i'm asking is what's the clarification on that or what well i and, and well, i think for work at places too if you have symptoms you don't if you're you don't necessarily test that day you sometimes test or you i mean you have to you have to go by whatever the medical person is saying you have to wait for to make sure that you have a high enough viral load so that the test will be accurate. I got that. Yeah, I was just, they was, I guess they was just wanting to know, like, a lot of them's coming back negative, which I know that's great. Absolutely. That is, that's a, yes. that's good, but they're missing a week of school yeah. for a runny nose. And I think at this point with the number of cases that we have, I think our nurses are trying to be very cautious with that. And, and again, we're, we wanna make sure that our students do have the work and the need, and then we do have mechanisms to be able to help make sure that if they do get behind, that we, we can kind of help get them caught up moving forward. Yes, sir. I don't negate that it is frustrating. It, it's frustrating for staffing, it's frustrating for a lot of things in that arena, but. Um, I think we need to be reasonable on that because we're about to head into allergy season and every single one of us is gonna have a runny nose. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't saying that just to make it thing. sound bad. Yeah. That's no, I, I, I that's get exactly you. what the parent told yes. me. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know what family doctor. I think with symptoms, some people will test you. You may have to go to one of the testing facilities to get a test, and then you have. I think you, normally what happens is that test takes three days to come back. I'm not sure which physician they talk Ms. to or which parent. You talk and to. again, I, I'm not a medical doctor, but I know when I was being tested, they told me that the rapid test typically they want you to wait 72 hours after your symptoms start it's more accurate versus i think what is it the pcr test that they can take and get it a little bit more accurate so i'm not i'm not sure if that was what it was sir or not but i don't want to speculate but i, I just remember that with a 72 hour piece that was what was shared with me but to sherry's point yeah i mean i, I think that 
we are heading into that allergy season. Yes. People are going to have runny, stuffy noses consistently. Um, I mean, there's got to be another symptom outside of just a runny nose. I mean, it to me you need at least a fever. Yeah, I would think a fever or um, something else that would that 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 is more definitive. Just a, just a runny nose. I mean, I I have a runny nose every morning when I wake up. <laughs> I don't think that would be difficult to make a definitive list. I know for us, the attestation statement that we say when we clock in, I think it has um, sore throat, fever, and nausea. I mean, it's like seven oh, yeah. things. So, right. I mean, it, it is a difficult thing to try to decide what the one, one symptom is that you could rule out. Because, again, then you could go back to asymptomatic patients. So you could argue that a lot. I do agree that we will have to keep some sense of this is not, this is my same symptoms that I have every year at this time versus, wow, I'm really congested and this is combined, com combined with a sore throat. So I don't disagree and I'm not sure what, I don't know how many people have run into that, but I think what they might have run into was more that, that you have to wait 72 hours for the test to test come back. Yeah. Not that you can that could be, be tested too. for 72 hours if you are currently symptomatic. Right. And, and I'll definitely make sure, pass that along to the NERT too. Yeah. Nurse Sadler in the, in the group, and I believe it is it is two minor symptoms is what yeah, I think our you protocol do says. More than but one symptom. but I, can, I completely understand what you guys are saying. We need to make sure that we're taking a look at it. It's not extent, a two. That's a parent's choice too. I mean, they they know what their kid has every year, so they can kind of discern between what's going on. Exactly. So I mean, I think we need to be reasonable about this whole thing, or we're gonna have everybody home testing. Agreed. All right. Any other comments, questions for the for the group? I do want to just uh, say to those that are and they're not here, but they may be listening, or somebody may be listening on their on their behalf. I appreciate all of the individuals that came here this this evening to speak. Um, we we certainly did listen to what you have to say. We're not ignoring what you had to say. What you had to say was very important. So please understand that we take what you have to say very very deeply and and and. And we factor all those things into our decision-making process. Uh, but I did want to thank all of them for, for being here this evening and for providing that input. Um, and if there's no other, if there's no other uh, comments or questions, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. West, the only yeah, other, okay, I'm sorry. The only other thing I have is I will be sending out a draft of proposed board meeting dates. So at our next oh, board okay. meeting, if we can kind of select, make sure we're good with those dates and get those kind of set up for the remainder of the year. We have two more board meeting dates set on the calendar, and that is the September 2nd date, which we will be presenting a draft of the capital plan. And also Ms. O'Bannon will be presenting <coughs> first budget our hearing. first budget hearing. And then we the following one is a Tuesday, the 14th of September. That will be where Mr. Perkins will be presenting um, the capital plan for approval. And Ms. O'Bannon will also have her second budget hearing. So okay. just those two are coming up. All right. I'll, I'll just stem off what you said. It, I do appreciate the parents coming in here. And it, uh, it's definitely overwhelming. It's easy to say you're going to come in here and talk, but it, it gets real when you come in here. And so I, I appreciate all the parents that come in here and they've, a lot of them's left, but I do appreciate them coming here and sharing their thoughts because mm -hmm. I'm a parent before I'm a board member, so. Certainly. Certainly it takes a lot of, a lot of courage, whether you agree or disagree. It does take courage to come on here and, and speak on your child's behalf. So I would, I would also say thank you, parents, if you're listening. We do appreciate it. We take that under consideration as we make decisions. Most of us have kids in the district. Most of us have uh, families in the district that we, we deal with regularly. I have two sons in the district, so when the decisions we make, uh, we do take them very seriously, and, and certainly um, we want to be reasonable, we want to be measured, we definitely want to take your, your consideration under advisement, so thank you for coming, and we appreciate you. All right. Motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Any discussion? If there is none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Good night. Thank you.